And welcome to Point of View. I'm Josh Barnes, and uh, this is our Tuesday live stream. Thank you for joining us. Have a couple things to talk about today, and uh, I mean, there's always a lot of things to talk about, but this is the show where we don't just talk about things, we look at them from a biblical point of view, a biblical perspective. So there's a lot of things out there to talk about. Justin, before we get into the main topic today, I want to get to something we, we touched on just a little bit yesterday, but um, I wanted to ask you about for those who who weren't watching the show yesterday about the pope and his his coming out of the closet if you will um actually in support of homosexual marriage where do you think um what are your thoughts on that doesn't this give a lot of catholics a big problem because they say that the pope is infallible and yet he keeps doing all these things that are against the Bible, so either the Pope is infallible or the Bible, it seems like it's hard for both of them to be infallible. Right, so what you said indicates to me you have not dealt a lot with Catholic apologists. Because Catholic apologists have the um, get-out-of-jail-free card. The Pope is not always 100% infallible. He is only infallible, guaranteed, when he is speaking ex-cathedra out of the seat, out of uh, teaching it as the the dogma of the church. Um, so in Catholicism, the Pope can be off his rocker 99% of the time. As long as he doesn't teach it ex cathedra, then he is not demanded to be infallible. So the fact of the matter is this Pope very clearly believes things that would have gotten him burned at the stake by every previous Pope uh, in, in Catholic history. But couple things first of all he didn't say so, that it but was catholics gay are, marriage but catholics you're, you're saying are, are allowed to disagree with the pope as long as he's not speaking ex cathedra right so he can there's there's so much stuff we could do a couple hours just on defining here like i've worked a lot with roman catholicism and and the apologetics related to it so i know where the distinctions lie here a, a, a normal roman catholic if you say well your pope did such and such, they're going to say, well, he's not infallible unless he's talking ex cathedra. So it, they're going to just dismiss you on that one. So the fact of the matter is, though, he came out in support of... There, there's debate about this because some people say it's a translational thing, but basically civil unions for homosexuals. Um, not necessarily marriage, but again, we know that this pope believes things no pope before him has has believed and and popes before him would have excommunicated him would have um burned him at the stake as a heretic things like that i mean he's he's pagan in his view of the world we saw this few years a few months ago when he was saying that um mother nature is is mad and that sort of stuff like this this do i believe this is the bombshell i think this is something that the conservative catholics are going to be very uneasy about because the fact of the matter is they this already is the man are. a appointing. lot of them are breaking from the right Pope on. this is the guy who's appointing the cardinals and all that sort of stuff so it's kind of like the president with supreme court justices he's packing the catholic court so to speak so right the entire catholicism is taking a very strong leftward lurch here so i think it's going to get very uncomfortable for for conservative roman catholics that believe a lot of what the Bible says concerning morals. Yeah, and this one, this this time, he's he said a lot of political things that have gotten a lot of conservatives upset. Um, this one, it really isn't so much political because it, it doesn't deal so much with whether the whether the government, um, you know, it's sort of a separate issue, right? Whether or not the government should allow people to be homosexual, which I think is sort of just, um, of course, uh, but. Whether, and it's not even so much about the government even recognizing their unions. Uh, it's really more about whether the church should recognize that as a uh, biblical marriage. And I think as Christians in the church, we should say, uh, yeah, okay, you're, you, you want to act a certain way. I understand you're, if you're not a Christian. But if you are a Christian and you're going to try to say that that action is now in accordance with the word of God— and it's clearly not. It's like saying, uh, you know, it's like saying, I, I, I want to take the Lord's name in vain. And we're going to say that that's OK. Well, no, it's it's not. Now, some people are going to do it. And I understand that because they don't believe in God. But if you do believe in God and you do want to follow the word of God, then you shouldn't try to say that that's OK because it's not right. Right. And here's the thing. If if you've gone 
your entire history dependent on the idea that you are not bound solely to Scripture, that you can go beyond Scripture in order to come up with the beliefs, then I don't think it should be a surprise when you start to believe you can then change Scripture to come up with your beliefs. I don't think it's a big leap because Scripture is only one of three uh, equal authorities in the Catholic view. You have Scripture, Tradition, and the Church. And right. the Church tells you what is and isn't Scripture and what the interpretation is. The church tells you what is and isn't tradition and what the interpretation is. So what's really the authority? Yeah. So you, can't, the... you can't hold the church to the fire. You can't fact check it. It's Rome. Rome says, that's why a lot of apologists, and I agree with this term, it's sola ecclesia. It's whatever the church. Whereas I believe sola scriptura, whatever scripture says, scripture alone is the infallible authority. For Rome, it's basically the churches. And this is the problem. When you give a pope this kind of authority... If he veers off into Marxism, which was condemned by every other pope before him, then now what do you do? Exactly. And so we're, we're dealing with kind of today, we're dealing with these um, big news issues that have happened uh, among the church. What we want to get to is someone who is definitely not a Catholic. He would be Protestant, really. Um, John Piper, who's a um, reformed theologian. Uh, part of uh, part of uh, he would identify with those who reformed from the Catholic Church, right? The uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation, and he on the other side of the spectrum actually came out last week and said that he he, he essentially suggested that Christians shouldn't vote for Trump. He didn't come out and say that, but he essentially suggested that. So I want to get your reaction on it, Justin. But I'm going to pull it up here um, on our. Uh, on the screen there for you, and I'm going to read just a little bit here of his blog post that he came out with, and uh, and get your reaction. So here we are: policies and persons, policies, persons, and path to ruin. This is by John Piper, the theologian. He says this: this article is probably as close as you will get to an answer on how I will vote in the upcoming presidential election. Probably. Right on. Only God knows what may happen in the next days. Nothing I say here is intended to dictate how anyone else should vote. I appreciate that. Thank you, John Piper. Yet, why are you publishing it if, if, that, if you don't want to influence people's votes, right? I feel like that's sort of... Well, he, he's not trying to say this is how you have to. I think, I think the, the way he concludes that paragraph clears up what he's saying. He says, this perspective may sway votes, but you need not be sinning a few way matters differently. I can go. appreciate okay. that, that balance. At Fair least. enough. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so here's what he says. Actually, this is a long overdue article attempting to explain why I remain baffled that so many Christians consider the sins of unrepentant sexual immorality, uh, which in the Bible is called porneia, unrepentant boastfulness in the Bible is called... Al I'm going to but butcher this, Justin. Maybe you can get the Greek. Can you do the Greek there for me? <laughs> The thing is, if he had actually put the, the, the Greek word instead of an English version of it, it would be a lot easier. Alizania, Al uh, but there's no Z in Greek. It'd probably be the Z sound. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'd have to see the actual Greek in front of me rather than the English version. So these are things he's, he's clearly accusing Trump of, right? He's saying unrepentant sexual immorality in the Bible is called porneia, unrepentant boastfulness in the Bible called alizania, unrepentant vulgarity, um, a, uh, and I'm not even going to try that one. Iscrogalia. Uh, Iscrologia. There you go. And unrepentant uh, factiousness. Just what's factiousness? Uh, probably my guess would be the uh, sort of divisiveness, like sowing discord, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. It's, it it, that's my like best like, guess. I'd, I'd have to actually look at the word. Factiousness to me just sounds like he's being truthful. Like, I'm like this sounds like a good thing. No, no factions. <laughs> Like, oh, se oh factions, separating into div factions. Dividing, okay. Um, and the like, um, are he says, are to be only toxic for our nation, while policies that endorse baby killing, sex, switching, freedom limiting, and socialist overreach are viewed as deadly. So he's saying this is how Christians, in his opinion, Christians look at the the sins of Trump, um, immorality, unrepentant boastfulness, unrepentant vulgarity, unrepentant fact factiousness, divisiveness, and the like to be only toxic for the nation while the policies that endorse baby killing, sex switching, freedom limiting, and socialist overreach are viewed as deadly. So he's saying, why do we put a, a higher priority on the sins of the Democratic Party and a lower priority on what he would call the sins of President Trump? Okay, so he says he said this, I re the reason I put those Greek words in parentheses is to give 
a graphic reminder that these are sins mentioned in the New Testament. To be more specific, they are sins that destroy people. They are not just deadly, they are deadly forever. Now, let's, let's break down that statement, right, Justin? Because, I mean, sin is deadly in the sense that he's talking about, right? Right. So, I mean, like, <laughs> sin leads to eternity in hell. Uh, it brings the judgment of God. So, technically speaking, he's correct about these sins being deadly in that sense, right? Right. The, the, the problem is he's already made, I think, two or three assumptions that are... And he's going to go on to, to, to make clear that he is making these assumptions by what he's going to go on to say in the article. But off the bat, he's he's already presumed a few things that I think are the, sort of the rot in the foundation of the article, so to speak. And, and I want to say this. I've benefited a lot from some of... Uh, I don't know if it's Dr. Piper or Brother Piper. I'm, I'm guessing as a doctorate, but uh, Brother Piper, I've benefited a lot from his writings, from some of his teachings. Um, so I'm not going, this is not a, a head hunting, you know, just out to, to crush a man's character kind of thing. But when he says, you, notice that there's a couple things here. He says, unrepentant sexual immorality, unrepentant boastfulness, unrepentant vulgarity, unrepentant fa uh, factiousness. What is all of that? That is sins of a person. But then when we get to um, policies endorsed like baby killing, sex switching, freedom limiting, and socialist overreach, what is this? These are sins of a nation. When we're talking about this, he is basically saying that a person's moral character is just as important as the moral character by which they govern by. And he's basically going to make the idea that this is a election that is based that is just about Joe Biden, Donald Trump. And let's compare the moral character. Joe Biden supports baby killing. Donald Trump has sin in his life. This is not what the election is. The election is about worldview. That is what this election is. Are we a, a worldview that is going to endorse the things that is Marxism that's accounted for hundreds of millions of deaths around the world in the past hundred years? Or are we going to embrace the worldview that is promoted by the platform Donald Trump is running on, regardless of his moral character and failings that he has? I don't think that he's he's making a comparison between these two things that I don't believe it, it makes a lot of sense. He's also going to go on this article to say that basically Christians are just passing over it like, oh, we don't think Donald Trump. We can we can say that these sins aren't a problem. No. Who says that? Show me. Who says that unrepented sexual immorality in the president is okay? Who says that unrepented boastfulness in the president is okay? I call his Twitter out all the time. Why? Because it's unrepented boastfulness. <laughs> right. But, in, but in a lot of cases. Thing. Here's the thing. I think he's, um, and this is what he says next. He says, forgiveness through Christ is always possible where there is repentance and childlike trust in, in, in Jesus, but where humble repentance is absent, the sin is, the sin's condemned. Uh, the New Testament teaches that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, to which you may say, so what? Rejecting Jesus as Lord also leads to death, but you are willing to vote for a non-Christian, aren't you? So he's, he's, he's bringing up the question, uh, which, which I think is the natural question to ask. Wait, why is, why is the fact that he's not a Christian a good reason to not vote for him? And here's where he kind of responds to that. He says, my point so far is simply to raise the stakes of what is outwardly modeled in leadership so that Christians are given pause. It is not a small thing to treat lightly a pattern of public behaviors that led to death. Okay, um, well, okay, fair. But it shouldn't, at this point, the fact that this person is a sinner and has sinned does not mean that you can't vote for them. Otherwise, you just wouldn't be able to vote at all. Okay. Um, right. I, I will. I will give him this. There is something to be said about unrepentant sin. It is a red flag. I'm, I'm not going to brush over that. Like, like it isn't a red flag that President Trump is extraordinarily arrogant, unrepentantly so. But, uh, but saying he's never had anything to repent of when he was talking in an interview about about uh, has he ever asked God for forgiveness? That sort of thing. That I'm. I'm. No one is going to brush that aside as if this is not a problem. Right. But, but there's it, also but a difference between it's comparing apples with oranges. Right. It is apples and oranges, but even if you if you do say that, there's a difference between public repentance and private repentance. So there's no proof 
I mean, sure, there's speculation, but we don't know for sure that that uh, Donald Trump hasn't repented privately of of things. We don't know that. Um, uh, we know that he hasn't repented publicly of them, right? That that's what we know. Well, I think true repentance is going to have fruit. Um, if President Trump had repented of, for example, the the pornia, as it's said, um, the sexual immorality, I think there would be evidence of that, especially with how public it has been. I think you're if your sin is public, your repentance also should be public. Um, it's just, I think, a, a good rule of thumb. And we haven't seen any of that. So as far as we know, it is unrepentant. And clearly his 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 arrogance and his factiousness, that sort of stuff, I can agree, is unrepentant as as far as we can tell. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to concede the character flaws. Right. Um, here's here is um, here's what he here's where he's going with that, though, because he's not just saying Trump has character flaws. He's actually saying these are are extremely um, damaging to the country. Trump's character flaws. So he says next nations. In fact, I think is a drastic is a, is a drastic mistake to think that the deadly influences of a leader come only through his policies and not through his person. This is not true. This is true not only because flagrant boastfulness, vulgarity, immorality, and factiousness are self-incriminating, but also because they are nation-corrupting. They move out from centers of influence to infect whole countries. The last five years bear vivid witness to this infection at almost every level of society. This is where I've got to stop him and I've got to say, what? This this is this is jumping from okay. We've got this this list of things that we feel. Um, our character flaws in Trump. And now we're going to jump from that and say Trump's character flaws infect the entire society. And the fact that we've been so divided over the last five years is now Trump's fault hanging around his neck because of his character flaws. And now that's going to influence my vote. Right. I, I would like to ask him what Donald Trump did that caused the Black Lives Matter riots and burning of, of American cities. That was not President Trump. Because here's, here's the thing. He's going to go on in the next paragraph, to uh, the next two paragraphs to talk about, um, well, for example, he brings up an example in, in, in uh, First Kings where it says that the leader, in the way he acted, he caused Israel to sin. Mm. What is it that President Trump has done that has caused the sin? Who is Who is modeling their life after President Trump right now? Who is saying, because President Trump is okay with uh, sexual immorality, I will now go be sexually immoral? We're not talking. We're not not comparing apples to oranges with the biblical text we're bringing up here. Yeah, this is not what happened. The division in America is not because people are modeling their life after what they see in President Trump. Right, it's not what we're seeing. If anything, Trump has modeled his life after the way America is. Right. Right. Trump is Trump is a response, not not the he didn't he didn't kill politics. He's the one that came by and said, "Oh look, politics is dead." Yeah. So we had a sexual revolution in America. Uh, what in the 60s, um, right. and this is this this is we have we have long ab- uh, abandoned the biblical uh, view of sexuality, right? So this pornea is not corrupting the nation. The nation is already corrupt in this matter, right? The nation has already left the word of God in this matter. Uh, it is now not only is it acceptable, it is it is very much applauded and seen as extremely normal. For a man and woman to to live together um, outside of marriage, this is this was this was rightly condemned before the '60s. Now it is completely acceptable and even applauded. Um, this is just not the biblical pattern. So uh, what I'm not trying to do is um, I know we have people from a bunch of different positions on this uh, issue that are watching. What I'm what I'm trying to do is just make this clear. That what the Bible says doesn't change, but the nation has changed a long time ago. So Trump is not perverting the nation in this matter. Trump is a result of the nation already being perverted in this matter. Right. So when you see this in the Old Testament, a lot of times you're going to see that that leaders cause cause the nation to sin. What is it they're doing? They're bringing in through their policy. They are bringing in idols. Right. They're bringing in idolatry into the country, and that is corrupting the people and causing them to sin. So when we talk about he caused them to sin, we're not talking about the moral character of the person. Now, granted, I don't know if that is the particular context of the text he's bringing up. I will have to, to 
do a, an in-depth exegesis of that particular text. But all throughout the Old Testament this is what we see. When is it the nation starts to sin? Is it when the ruler has bad moral character? No. Solomon actually had awful moral character, yet it was one of the greatest times of blessing for Israel, mm -hmm. even though towards the end he made a lot of mistakes that leads to the fall of the nation. But for a while there, awful moral character, but greatly blessed by God. Why? Because when they caused the people to sin, it was when they were bringing in policy, so to speak, in modern vernacular, that corrupted the nation. Yeah. So in modern American vernacular, they brought in the Equality Act. They brought in more Planned Parenthood funding. So what he is bringing up is the exact reason that Trump should be your option as a Christian. Yeah. And by the way, this whole idea that people voted for Trump in spite of his policies because of his attitude is just not true. People actually voted in spite of his attitude because of his policies. Because of his policies. This is actually There's a, really a whole good... book about this called In Trump We Trust, E Pluribus Awesome, written by Ab Ann Coulter, that discusses this idea that people people get it backwards on this. Look, it for me, my support of Trump is in spite of his character because of his policies, because I don't want him to lead the nation into sin from his policy. Yeah. And, you know, there's a really good illustration of this in the um, in the Old Testament. There's a king. You probably never heard of him. Uh, his name was David. And <laughs> King David uh, actually committed adultery with another man's wife. Um, he then to cover that up. Um, essentially murdered the man um, and then uh, things started happening to David um, that really were God's payment to him for what he had done. His his son raped his daughter. His other son killed that son because he was uh, upset about him raping the daughter and um, it just, it was a whole mess that David dealt with. And what happened was Absalom, the son who had killed the other son, Amnon, um, comes and and actually convinces the nation of Israel to turn against David because of his immorality. And they actually thrust David out of the kingdom, even though David had was was arguably the best king that, uh, that the nation ever had and ever would have. Um, and this is, this is the situation that if, if John Piper lived during the time of David, he would have supported Absalom thrusting David out Absolutely. of the kingdom. And that's the problem is when we when we look at the Old Testament, which he's appealing to here, when we look at the the pattern of God blessing and not blessing a nation, we see that it is through the leader policy wise supporting that which is right or policy wise going against it. What is it that we see the good leaders did? They tore down the high places of false worship and all that. What is it that the bad leaders did? Not always do we get a big thing about their character, but why does God say that they did that which was wrong in God's eyes? Because they brought in bad policy, so to speak, that was about corrupting the moral ground of America. That is not what – that's not what Donald Trump is doing. Now, some people have brought up this argument that, well, you know, when he gets a second term and he doesn't have to worry about re-election – we're, at that point, we're begging the question. We're playing with facts that are not in evidence. As we have seen so far, President Trump has been moderately so, and I think towards the high end of the scale, a righteous leader. He's not, it, I don't agree with all of his stuff concerning his position on LGBT stuff and, and others, but as far as being a bulwark against Marxism, which is an ungodly, God-forsaken worldview, that it that assumes atheism from the offset mm -hmm. from from the outset he has stood against that he has called out intersectionality he has called out all of uh, this radical marxist stuff and his policies have promoted in a lot of ways biblical values that is what the old testament leaders did that were blessed by god so we're not we're not using we're not abusing scripture here to 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 counter this, in fact, I'd say it's an abuse of scripture to try to say we can't support Donald Trump. This is an argument I've been having for four years now, and I, I think it's just getting everything backwards. And I would say that that the president has has. I don't think the president is viewed in people's eyes as a role model. I suppose he could, but because we have the system of government that we have, where we actually choose the president. 
I think that the president isn't so much a role model that sets the tone of the country. The president is a result of the tone of the country. So instead of saying, well, we need a president who's going to really model uh, what the country should be, you're not going to get that president elected because he's not what the country is. The, the country chooses a president who they, um, who they identify with. Now, I understand Christians saying, well, I don't identify with the actions or, or the character of, of Trump. If that's the way you look at it, um, then I understand you're not identifying with him. But as Christians, we ought to look at it differently. I don't think we should be so surface level in, in our approach because, because Christians have never had the luxury of, in, in, throughout history of being able to choose their leaders. I mean, this is something that is a great privilege for Christian people in this nation and exclusively, really, in, in, in modern times has this been something that's possible for Christian people to choose their own leaders. In the past, they've had wicked leaders, they've had terrible rulers, and that's pretty much the only, only thing they had. They had no, no ability to make any change or make any effect. Now we do. And when we, we, we look at this, we are so spoiled as, as Americans to say, I refuse to vote for a man who has great policies, who's defending uh, Christianity um, and, crea- and defending my, my religious liberty because I just think I deserve a better candidate, a candidate who has better uh, a better mouth and a candidate who is better than this. You realize that the first century Christians would think, how spoiled are you? You get to choose your candidate. You get to choose between two people over who's going to rule you and you aren't happy with your choices. So you're just not going to choose. I mean, frankly, to again, this is even assuming this election is really about Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. And it's not. It's yeah. about a Marxist worldview versus the the worldview that is at least flawed in some sense, but the, the worldview that represents those who are against uh, Marxism, those who are against um, the, the the infanticide we see going around the country. Yeah. This is a worldview has shown us issue. how much they would like to control our lives if they can. Absolutely, yeah. And what we're talking about is a worldview that says at least in some ways is supportive of biblical perspective and a worldview that is inherently antithetical to the biblical worldview. Yeah. This is this is the decision. We're not just talking about people. We are talking about what worldview do we want publicly promoted in America? Do we want exactly. the worldview that is actually wiping out the intersectionality, critical race theory garbage that's being promoted, which is what one of the best things President Trump, I think, has done is going after critical race theory and... and Maybe not the most articulate way it could be done, but he's at least gone after it, which no one else has had the guts to do, even yeah. in churches. But in practice, this is he's gone about... way further than anyone. He he may not right, this... he may not have all the articulation of of you know when they ask him in the debate what's wrong with critical race theory, he may not be able to articulate it like like someone like Ben Shapiro. But he would knows be able it's to. a problem. Yeah. But but he knows it's a problem and his actions have gone way further than anyone's ever been able to go. He's able to get things done. This is what we need in a president, someone who can actually do what everyone else just talks about. Right. And and the fact of the matter is, I think another thing is we are also in an election that is going to decide if we have any more elections. And I'm not saying in the sense of it being just like, OK, we're not going to we're not going to vote anymore. But if the Democrats get into power. And California becomes uh, much more powerful with more Senate seats and all that sort of stuff. Washington, D.C. becomes a state. Um, you know, we we start. What What is it? Puerto Rico becomes a state. Is it Puerto Rico? What I'm thinking of is that, is that uh, the right one? Yeah, Puerto Rico. Yeah. If, if all that happens, we're having an election about do we have any more elections? If they pack the Supreme Court, all of that. And what I mean by that is Kamala, Kamala Harris has said that. California is the role model for what America should be. Let me ask you, any Republicans in California, does your vote matter? No, it doesn't. And if the Democrats do what they want to do, no vote matters anymore Anymore. because the Democrats just have have stacked the deck in their favor and there will be no more, no more election in that sense. Court packing, election packing, election rigging, all of that is actually really on the ballot today. Uh, not you today, want to be able to have week. a say in the future of America if you have a dissenting point of view. Yeah. So you don't if they win. So while we respect the intelligence and the and the um, uh, theolo- the, the theology 
of John Piper, and uh, and he is a great mind in the in theology. Uh, I have to say, I think I think you got this one wrong. Not only wrong, but very wrong, extremely wrong. And, and if you uh, want a, a more thorough covering as well, I would recommend uh, Alpha and Omega Ministries, Dr. James White on on uh, this on the twenty second of October. He uh, covered this. He covered several other issues first, but then he covered this article about a half hour on it as well, going into a lot of detail. I'd recommend looking that up. Yeah, and be, it's great. Uh, very I, I watched part of that um, just today before we before we did this. So that's all of our time. We're at our 30 minute mark. Thanks for joining us for the Tuesday live stream here at Point of View. Put your comments into the comments section and we will read them live on the air next week. Um, and uh, next week, actually, I'm not sure if we're going to be on the air. We, we, we probably be on the air, but we'll be doing it a little differently just because we'll be watching election coverage as everything rolls in. So going to be exciting. We're going to, we're going to be with you through it all. And even afterwards and all the aftermath and all the dust settling, We'll be there to walk you through it, to walk you off the ledge, and to give you the biblical point of view. We'll see you next time.